I'm Alec Moran, so I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you to this is, I believe, the fourth in our uh, lecture series, um, uh, annual lecture uh, sponsored by the uh, Neuroscience of Language Lab at NYU Abu Dhabi, which is itself funded by the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, which is uh, organizing this ser general series of public lectures. So I'm going to introduce our uh, distinguished speaker, Karen Emery. But um, first, um, I want to give some update on uh, what's going on in the, in the lab in Abu Dhabi. Um, so we now have, you can see uh, in the lower slide, part of the slide, um, a, a large set of researchers uh, using uh, the lab. So we hope for lots of interesting results this year. Um, the Neuroscience of Language Lab in Abu Dhabi is, involves linguistic research centered around the state-of-the-art MEG machine. So the questions that uh, we get asked a lot is, you know, why do we use MEG and why are we in Abu Dhabi of all places? Um, why MEG is, MEG is a, a, a technique for monitoring the activity of the brain that gives us information about activity millisecond by millisecond, and with, uh, it tells us where in the brain the activity is uh, taking place. So we're able to address fundamental questions about language through measurement of brain responses uh, over time and over brain space. Why is Abu Dhabi good? Well. Uh, we were given the opportunity to build a new MEG facility there that has properties that are unique to MEG facilities worldwide. Um, and if you know about Abu Dhabi, you know that uh, the population there is uh, incredibly mixed in terms of um, native languages. So, of course, there are Arabic speakers, uh, uh, both of um, standard Arabic and uh, uh, dialectal uh, Emirati Arabic. But there also is an uh, a enormous uh, population of, of workers from around the world, particularly from India, speakers of uh, Hindi and Urdu, uh, southern Indian speakers of um, Malayalam and Tamil, and interestingly, speakers of um, uh, Filipino speakers of uh, Tagalog. So MEG, um, uh, electrical activity in the brain, sets up magnetic fields that we can measure using this instrument you see in the white um, looks like an uh, overturned toilet bowl. That's a thermos of liquid helium. The sensors are superconducting coils with superconducting quantum interference devices, or squids. And using the information from these sensors, we can reconstruct uh, in the uh, activity in the brain, uh, as you can see on the right. Um, and we can do that millisecond by millisecond. Uh, we had uh, you know, festivities for opening ceremonies where you can see on the lower left, uh, gifts were exchanged. Uh, uh, NYU Abu Dhabi got this fancy Japanese uh, picture and the people from Japan got baseball hats with NYU Abu Dhabi on it. So. Uh, our new teams of re researchers are in place uh, uh, and they're working very hard. Um, uh, the, the connections here, uh, I thought I'd show this slide. Um, so Lena Pulkinen and uh, David Puppel are co-PIs of the lab there, and Karen Emery is our speaker there. We are part of a, a larger community of uh, cognitive neuroscience of language that's at the forefront of um, work in this area. And uh, what we can tell you now is we're starting to get um, results that are from the machine in Abu Dhabi that use uh, Arabic speakers uh, to exploit um, differences between Arabic and English. So here, um, the um, co-authors are uh, a graduate student in the audience, Masha Westerloon, uh, and also um, Itamar Kostner is here, who is Israeli. Um, Mira Al-Kabi is, is Emirati. So we have a uh, good mix of um, Middle Eastern authors on this one. And Lena Pulkinen is the lead on this study. Uh, 
Um, it, it, there are constructions in Arabic that involve um, noun followed by adjective, where in English we would have the adjective before the noun, and this study shows that um, that word order does not affect basic combinatoric um, operations that the brain performs. So we, we were able to, by using Arabic, you could take out whether the results in English were just due to the order of adjective and noun. Um, another study uh, here um, is way too complicated for me to explain in two minutes, but <laughs> it should look impressive to you. Um, <laughs> Uh, it involves an effect of uh, you see a display and then you read a sentence. And the effect of the uh, position of the uh, object being referred to in the display, so where the tree is in the display, uh, you see that effect when you, uh, you are processing the word tree. So that involves um, um, resolving the reference of the word in the uh, your mental image of the scene that you saw earlier. And you see effects of that here. Um, so research is underway, uh, exploiting MEG and exploiting um, the population of speakers in Abu Dhabi. So uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Karen Emery, who uh, here, this is from the website of uh, her lab. Uh, the, the front page of the website announces this talk, so it's really good. <laughs> Um, so, in linguistics, we know Karen in particular for her work on sign language. And part of uh, the work on sign language is showing that sign language is a um, real language, just like other languages, same properties, and um, the brain processes sign language very similarly to the way it processes spoken languages. But Karen, although she's part of a set of scientists who help establish that, um, she's now going well beyond simply demonstrating that sign language is a language and uses the same parts of the brain as normal language. There are differences, of course, between um, seeing, <laughs> seeing language rather than hearing language. So we, what Karen is using is, is using the differences between um, uh, the modalities of language to see the commonalities and differences in the way the brain processes these things. And it's under, um, it's giving us enormous new insight to uh, how um, the brain does language in general. So without further ado, Karen. Um, okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, to this incredible city. It's really great. I've already had a great time last night. So, um, And what I hope to do is share with you a little bit about my research and what the study of sign languages, as Alex said, can tell us about the nature of human language and about the brain. And I want to start by simply giving you a flavor of sign languages around the world. So in the top left, we have um, a signer of American Sign Language. She's actually giving a short little lecture on the structure of the brain. We have next to her um, a woman from uh, the Netherlands who's telling a fable in Sign Language of the Netherlands. This is part of a very large corpus that's been collected in the Netherlands to study uh, cross-generation uh, variation, sociolinguistic variation across the country. And this is just one example uh, from that corpus. Then the next one in the bottom left there is from my colleagues Diane Lillo-Martin uh, and Ronise Quadros, who are studying language acquisition by deaf children and hearing children of a sign language. And they're looking at uh, the acquisition of American Sign Language and uh, Libras, or uh, Brazilian Sign Language, because these two systems are quite different. They have different verbal systems, and they're looking at how these children acquire um, sign language. And then the final one is just an example from a number of different sign languages. So in linguistics articles, linguists will give you examples of grammatical and ungrammatical sentences in the languages that they're studying. For sign languages, we do this with video, with DVDs, with websites, so that you can actually go and look at the different examples from those linguistic articles. And that's what this is from. And so what I want to do is sort of give you a feeling about what the study of sign languages and the deaf and hearing people who use them to convince you that they have a lot to teach us. In particular, what sign languages can tell us 
is about what's universal to all human languages. So it's really important to look at sign languages as well as spoken languages if you want to make generalizations about human language in general. And I would argue that theories that can account for both signed and spoken language data are to be preferred over theories that really are very speech-centric, just account for speech data, or theories that just account for sign language data. We want general theories that can account for both types of languages. Sign languages can also tell us um, about how language is structured by the input characteristics, by the characteristics of audition versus vision. So for example, the auditory system is very good at fast temporal resolution. And if you look at spoken languages, transitions between speech sounds are something like 40, 30, 40 milliseconds. The visual system, on the other hand, is very good at taking in information simultaneously. And it turns out that these two properties um, affect the linguistic structure of generally of sign versus spoken languages. So spoken languages have a very linear structure with lots of sound segments um, concatenated in, to create words, uh, lots of single segment uh, morphemes, meaning units. Sign languages just prefer linear structure. They prefer simultaneous structure. So you see lots of information conveyed simultaneously on the face. So grammatical facial expressions that coincide with manual signs. So this is taking advantage of the perceptual systems that each language occurs in. We can also look to see what aspects of language are affected by the output systems, by the fact that you use the tongue and the vocal tract versus the hands. So for example, for sign languages, you have these two independent articulators that are directly visible. And this has an effect on the types of signs that you see. So for example, signs can look like action. So for example, the sign for push looks like this. Okay. Uh, signers can use their hands to locate things in space. So you can talk about something being above or next to or below. And I'm going to explore how these differences might impact um, the way uh, spatial and uh, action information is encoded and the way the brain processes these types of information. So what I want to do is pose three questions today. One is, do all human languages represent meaning, that is semantics, independently of form, that is phonology? So I'll talk about sign language phonology, which may seem a little bit counterintuitive. How can you have a phonology without sound? The word phon suggests sound. Well, it turns out that you can talk about patterns of form. You can talk about sign language having a phonology. And the question that we'll look at is whether this is separate from meaning. We're going to look at whether the brain distinguishes between pantomime and language when these things look the same. And finally, does the biology of linguistic expression, that is meaning the fact that you're using hands in space, impact the brain bases for spatial language, that is how you talk about spatial information. And I've selected these three questions because they really give you an idea of how sign languages, the study of sign languages can be used as a tool to understand the nature of language and its representation in the brain. So let's start with the first one. Uh, do all human languages represent meaning independently of form? Now the reason this question arises, I mean you can think about it for spoken languages, right? The, the word for tree in English and the word for tree in French, arbre and for German, what is a baum in German, right? There's no relationship between those sounds and a tree, okay? But it turns out that sign languages have what's called um, iconicity. So it's often that the form of the signs reflect their meaning. So for example, the sign for hairbrush looks very much like the action of brushing your hair. The sign for ball, okay, it resembles the shape of a ball. This is the sign for Scotland. So it kind of iconically depicts the sort of plaid scarves that um, Scotsmen wear. Uh, and the sign for mind is located at, at the brain. So you see these real the clear relationships between signs and meaning. So maybe in sign languages, you don't have this separation. Maybe the phonology, you get to interrupt. <laughs> well, what's the sign for brain if this is the sign for mind? They're actually homophones, and you can you distinguish them from mouthing, with mouthing. So you can go mind and brain. Unless my deaf colleagues want to... Yeah? Good? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, are these, in a sense, collapsed in sign languages is the question. And 
If that's the case, if sort of form and meaning are collapsed, then signers should not um, experience what um, the equivalent to um, a tip of the tongue phenomenon. Okay, so um, tip of the tongue phenomenon is one of these experiences where you know the meaning, but you can't retrieve the form. Okay, so you know the word you want, uh, but you can't get it. And so I'm, we're going to sort of do a little test here to see if we can elicit um, a TOT. Now, if so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a picture with a definition. I want you to think of the word. Now, if you know the word, don't say it. Because your neighbor next to you may be having a tip of the tongue where they, it's like, okay, I know what that is, but I don't know the word. So here we go. Anybody in a TOT? It's Periscope, if you will, if you were. Now, um, tip of the tongue occurs with words like this, but it's, much, it's more common with um, proper nouns. So names of cities, names of people, um, in part because there's really only one word that you can retrieve that's appropriate. You have to retrieve that person's name or the name of the city. You can't paraphrase or get around it. And so you really have to get that name. Um, so we'll see if we can get another one here. So you may know all about this person. You may know she won an Academy Award for As Good As It Gets. Um, you may even know what her name starts with, um, but if you're in a TOT, you wouldn't be able to actually retrieve her name. Anybody in a TOT? No? Mm -hmm. Helen Hunt, if you were. All right, so the point of this is that what this evidence from, a TO, from TOTs shows is that, at least for spoken language, there really are two separate stages. There's separate processes, or at least you can retrieve the meaning without retrieving the form, okay? Um, so that in a TOT, you get one aspect, but you don't get the other one. Okay, you get meaning but not form. So our question now for signers is, okay, well, do signers experience this? Because if semantics and form were collapsed, if you get the meaning, you should get the form. So we shouldn't see examples of, of tip of the finger, which is what we sort of called it for sign languages. So we conducted two studies. One was simply a diary study where we asked signers to keep track of whether they ever had this experience where they knew the sign they wanted, but they couldn't retrieve it. And then in a second um, experiment, we, did, we tried to elicit TOTs similar to, um, ha well, not with pictures, but we used um, English words that you had to translate. But the idea is you had to produce a particular sign so that we could sort of elicit tip of the fingers. And I'll just mention this, why I have this um, image up here. What this person is signing is the equivalent of English um. It looks like this. So if you can't think of something, you'll see this. So if you watch signers and they do this, it means they're saying um. OK. So what about the diary study? So um, here we had people just keep track over about a month. Did they ever have this experience? And the answer was yes. So all of the signers ex uh, reported experience, this feeling of knowing a sign. Uh, but not being able to, to produce it. Um, and interestingly, the rate of TOFs was about the same as TOT. So about once a week, people had these. So what this suggests is that you, you um, do have this separation. And the fact that the rate is about the same suggests that the sort of iconicity of signs is not impacting this processing. So we have separation of form and meaning. The other interesting thing to look at is um, what types of information you sometimes retrieve when you're in one of these TOT or tip of the finger states. It can tell us something about the nature of lexical access or word retrieval. So one of the things you probably know if you've ever been in a TOT is, okay, I know it starts with a B, okay? You'll, you'll know some information. And often it's onset. It's the beginning of the words. And that's telling us that there's something... Um, important about uh, onsets, that those are more easily retrieved than other aspects. So the question was, what about um, for signs? Um, here we couldn't really rely on the diary study so much because that's hard to write down. Um, so here we wanted to look at the, um, an, an elicitation task, an experiment, where we brought people into the lab. We gave them um, English words of names of cities, um, names of people who had name signs, who had signs, or low frequency items to try to see if when you had to produce the sign, um, we got people in a, in, a, in a TOF. And then we asked them about the form of the sign. Now before I go into what we found, I just want to say something about, well, what do you mean the form of sign? What, what's, what is, you know, how does that compare to spoken languages? Well, so spoken languages, you know, you can divide words up into consonants and vowels. You can have different consonants, different vowels. Well, linguists have looked at signs and found a similar type of patterning 
so that you can break signs up into their component parts. So this is an example of signs that differ just in location. So the sign for apple is made at the chin, onion is made at the um, cheek. They just differ in location. Uh, the signs please and sorry, please, sorry, just differ in the handshape. And the signs sit and train, sit, train, just differ in the movement. So just in the way you can have words that just differ with respect to one consonant or one vowel, we can have signs that differ according to location, um, hand shape, also orientation. So the sign for children looks like this, and, or children, thing, just the orientation of the hand, as well as movement. So when, when our participants in this experiment were in a tip of the finger state, we asked them, okay, how much of the form can you remember? Can, do you know the location? Do you know the movement? Do you know the hand shape? To try to get at what types of information they were able to retrieve, if they were able to retrieve something. So our question, do they recall partial information? The answer is yes. Um, and here's one example. So this was um, producing the sign for Scotland. And the sign for Scotland looks like this. Okay. And the person could retrieve everything except the location. So they did something like this. Okay. So they were trying to figure out what the location was. Um, they knew the hand shape, they knew the movement, but they, it took them a while to retrieve the location. So what we looked at then was just, okay, well, what types of information overall were more accurately retrieved when you're in a tip of the finger state? And it turns out that, um, if you look at um, what aspects of the phonology, location, orientation, or handshape were retrieved most accurately, it was that bundle of information. Okay? And it turns out that that bundle, the location, the handshape, the orientation of the hand, constitutes the sign onset, at least perceptually, so that those are the elements that you see all at once. What unfolds over time is the movement. And the movement of the sign was turned out to be the least accurately recalled or retrieved in a, in a tip of the fingers. We also looked, we sort of coded for each of these different parameters um, whether they were particularly iconic in the sign or not, and did that predict? So maybe you were more um, accurate in, in retrieving an iconic feature than a non-iconic one, and that turned out not to be the case. So this suggests that for both speech, for retrieving spoken words and signs, what's critical is sort of the, the onset, and that's what has sort of priority access in, in the, the lexicon. So what does this tell us? Um, one is that despite the fact that you see this, um, these iconic properties, we still have a kind of two-stage process in retrieving words. You get the meaning and then you get the form and they can be uh, independent of each other. You can get one and not the other. It also nicely um, shows that um, all human languages have this level of form representation that's got to be assembled during um, production. Okay? So it's not just a holistic form, even though signs look like they might be holistic, they have to be assembled. Um, for spoken languages, the units that you assemble um, are based on the vocal tract, so uh, place of articulation within the vocal tract, where the tongue is. For sign, it ha there, there's different um, properties, so it's hand shape, movements, and locations, but a lot of the same linguistic um, uh, mechanisms or tools that we use to understand the form-based patterning in spoken languages surprisingly applies to sign languages as well. So, do all human languages represent meaning uh, independently of form? And the answer here is yes. So now I want to move to the second question that I raised that arises when you look at sign languages, and this is whether or not we see um, a neural distinction between pantomime and language when they look the same. But before I answer that question, I really feel like I first have to tell you something that Alex alluded to in his introduction, which is just, okay, well, what do we know about just language and sign language in the brain generally? Do we see that the same key brain regions that have been um, shown to be important for spoken language, are they also important for, for sign languages, given we have these huge differences between perceptual and motor systems. So I'm going to just talk about two key regions that um, are known to be important for spoken language. One is Broca's area that's long been known to be important for speech production. And the other is so-called Wernicke's area, which is 
known to be involved in, in speech comprehension. Now, interestingly enough, Broca's area is just in front of, just anterior to the motor speech regions, right? And Wernicke's area is just posterior to auditory cortex. So maybe these regions take on their functions because they're close to the input-output systems for spoken language. So what about sign languages? Because, of course, sign languages are not primarily produced with the vocal articulators, but with the hands. The hands are further up on the motor strip. They're in a different region. And they're perceived visually, and visual cortex is in the back of the brain. So do we see these two regions being involved in the production or the perception of sign language? So if we first look at production, so this is um, results from a large study um, where we looked at signers, deaf signers, producing single signs in a picture naming task. And we looked at speakers producing spoken words, again, in a picture naming task. And we just looked to see what regions of the brain are equally active for both spoken and uh, signed word production. And so what we see is this nice area, Broca's area is active for both. So what this is telling us is that the function of Broca's area is not tied to the linguistic speech articulators. So despite the fact that it's just anterior to um, motor and somatosensory cortex that controls the tongue, despite the fact that there's strong connections between those regions and auditory cortex, we still see that Broca's area is involved in sign language production. I'll also just mention, because it'll come back later, this um, left inferior temporal region here um, was engaged for both. This seems to be a region that's particularly involved in picture naming type tasks where you have to retrieve a particular word. It seems to be at the interface between, let's say, object recognition um, and, uh, retrie and, and the language processes involved in retrieving a word that would name that um, object, because that'll come up later. Um, in, a, in another study. Okay, so what about uh, language input? This is data from a number of different imaging studies across several years where um, participants were visually perceiving sign language, either um, sentences or words. And what you can see is that in all of these cases, you see activation in this auditory region, in Wernicke's region, along the superior temporal cortex. So this is, again, telling us that this region doesn't have its function because it's auditory. It's involved also in the um, visual comprehension of a sign language. It's, it's a language area. And what's also nice is if you look, um, so remember, these guys, in fact, in all of these studies, these are deaf people, OK? So they're not, um, they, they're um, congenitally deaf, born deaf. They're not getting auditory input. So what happens to their auditory cortex? So if we look at just the structure of the auditory cortex, so now we're looking not at function, not at whether the auditory um, regions are firing, but we're just looking at whether or not we see any differences in gray matter. Um, that is, um, gray matter is basically a measure of the, the neurons, right? And we can look at two, er we looked at two areas in um, deaf brains compared to hearing brains. One uh, area is called Heschel's gyrus. That's the primary auditory cortex. So this is the first area in the cortex that receives sound. And what we found is no difference at all in deaf brains um, compared to hearing brains. So auditory cortex does not atrophy for deaf signers. Um, and we also see the same asymmetry where it's larger on the left than in the right for both um, deaf and um, hearing individuals. And if we look at um, what's sometimes been associated with Wernicke's area, the planum temporale, it's a little bit um, more posterior. Again, you can look at the size um, of the planum temporale, temporale compared to deaf and hearing people, no difference. You also see the same asymmetry, larger on the left than on the right. So what the asymmetry difference or lack thereof is telling us is that these asymmetries in hearing people aren't because they can hear or because they use spoken language. These are something that either come with language processing or, come, or, or, or um, could be um, innate. Um, but it's not due to sound experience, because we see the same asymmetries for the deaf guys. All right, so if I come back to visual processing of sign, these are these um, same comprehension studies. Um, I want to note one other thing, which is Broca's area is also um, involved in comprehension. So Broca's area turns out to be a really interesting area for language processing, multifunctional. So I want it, didn't want you to think that it, it only is involved in production. It's also involved in comprehension. 
Um, and I also want to just mention um, that these same um, experiments compared signers with speakers. So underneath each, we've got um, American Sign Language. The next one over is British Sign Language. Just to um, let you know, American Sign Language and British Sign Language are completely different languages, despite the fact that they're surrounded by the same spoken language. They have different histories, uh, different morphologies, different fingerspelling systems. They're mutually unintelligible. Um, and then the last one is Japanese Sign Language. And below that, you see the neural activation for hearing people either processing written text in the, the far one or even a better um, appropriate comparison, uh, um, processing um, audiovisual English, that is spoken English, you're watching someone talk, and the same thing for spoken Japanese. And what I hope you can see here is that you really see very similar neural circuits in the left hemisphere for sign language processing and for spoken language processing. So we come back to my sort of question there, are the same key uh, brain regions um, that are involved in spoken language also involved in sign language? Um, and clearly the answer is yes. Okay, so we have strong overlapping language regions. So now what I want to do is, is ask this question about pantomime versus language, because now we know what the language regions are. So the reason this comes up for sign languages is because unlike um, words, signs can have these pantomimic qualities. They can look like gestured actions. So um, these um, verbs are often called handling verbs because they, sh they sort of um, show how you would hold um, an object. Um, and here's a couple examples. The sign for scrub, the sign for drink. Okay? All right. So they look very much like pantomimes, right? This is not true for their English translations. So what about the difference between pantomimes and signs? Well, one thing to think about is that with pantomimes, the way you produce a pantomime is very much um, determined by the object that you're interacting with. So if you were to pantomime drinking from a straw or drinking from a mug or drinking from a shot glass, you would have very different gestures, very different pantomimes. Okay. Now, the ASL sign for drink okay, is stored in the lexicon. Right? And it means consume liquid. And you can use this sign if, regardless of what someone is drinking out of, whether it's a mug or a coffee cup or um, you know, a straw. It just means the liquid was consumed. Um, and you um, have to retrieve the right hand shape, the right location, the right movement. So it's a lexical sign. Okay? So our question was, does the brain make this distinction um, when there's um, a, a pantomime that looks exactly like a sign, and yet they have these different properties. So I've told you a little bit about the regions that are engaged um, for language production, sign production, but what about pantomime production? So an area that's been highlighted for pantomime production is called the um, superior parietal lobule, or SPL. Okay? And when you ask hearing people to um, produce pantomimes, like um, tool use, show me how you would use a tool, um, you see um, activation in um, left, in particular, um, SPL. Okay. So our hypotheses were, if these sort of pantomimic signs, like drink and scrub, um, if they pattern like pantomime, if they're really kind of different, what we should see is greater activation in the superior parietal um, lobule for these signs because they're sort of engaging pantomimic type regions of the brain. On the other hand, um, if pantomimic signs pattern like spoken words, we should see activation in, in Broca's area um, because you're producing signs. Um, and when we ask people, hearing people to produce pantomimes, you don't see activation in Broca's area. And when you ask people to um, produce words, you don't see activation in SPL. Okay? So we want to sort of tease these, see if the brain makes the same kind of distinction. Which way do these signs pattern? Do they pattern like pantomimes, or do they pattern like verbs, like signs? OK, so um, to do this, we um, conducted um, a study using positron emission tomography. This is um, like, most of you are probably more familiar with fMRI. Both of them measure blood flow in the brain. fMRI is a little more spatially um, uh, exact than PET, but the advantage of PET is it's more tolerant of movement. So how many of you have been in an fMRI study or, or in an MRI? Anybody? A few of you? Okay. How many to were told to lay very still and not move? <laughs> right? So when you're in, in, in imaging, you really have to lay as still as possible. Your head moves a couple millimeters and the data is worthless. 
you can't move all around in PET, but it's more tolerant of movement. So we really could have people producing pantomimes more easily and producing signs more easily. So um, what we asked people to do while they were in the scanner was um, to produce verbs or pantomimes. I'll go through those tasks in a minute. Um, I want to say one other thing about our participants. We had um, deaf um, ASL signers. In all of our studies, we look um, mostly at deaf people who have deaf parents who acquired um, sign language as their native language from birth. Part of this is because, so all the studies I've shown you so far in comparing brain regions for sign and speech have used this population. And the reason is because we sort of want to compare apples with apples. So when you look at um, hearing people processing language, they're native speakers of English. They've been exposed to English from birth. So we want to use the same kind of population, the same exposure um, to language from birth. So that's our, our population. And then our 14 hearing signers didn't know any sign language. All right, so what did we have them do? So to get at um, the brain regions involved in verb production, we had them generate verbs. They would see, this was only, of course, the deaf people who know sign. Um, they would see an object, a manipulable object, and they were asked to just produce a verb that goes with that object. This is sort of a classic task. It's actually not a great task, but um, for our purposes, it we were able to then compare it with pantomime generation. So now you see um, a picture of a manipulable object, but instead of producing a verb, you're asked to show me how you use this object. So you produce a pantomime. And this we had both hearing and deaf people do. And then we had a baseline where you saw, again, manipulable objects, and you decided whether or not the object could be held or not. OK, so for the verb generation one, we had two um, types of objects. So one, um, these objects were pre-tested to elicit these types of pantomimic verbs, these handling verbs. I'll show you what those look like in a sec. But we also had a set of objects that the verb was not this kind of sensory motoric iconic sign. So they didn't have these sort of handling properties. So we could compare sort of pantomimic type verbs with non-pantomimic verbs. Okay. So here's what they look like. So here would be a picture um, of, um, that you would see. And your job was, OK, generate a verb that goes with this. And these generated these handling verbs. So here's the verb for write, okay, and the ASL verb for hammer. Okay. So these were these sort of pantomimic type verbs. Here are the, um, some examples of objects that didn't elicit um, pantomimic verbs. So if you saw a ruler, here's a verb that goes with a ruler. And this is my favorite, um, pour syrup. Okay, so it doesn't look like how you would hold it. You can use that for salad dressing too. But it's clearly it's not a handling verb. Okay, so in the pantomime generation task, we um, had people show me how you would use the object. For the non-signers, the hearing people, we also had them generate pantomimes to the objects that I just showed you, so the, the hammer and the pen, um, so that we can compare verb generation with pantomime generation for those same items, where the pantomimes look very much like the verbs. But here's um, examples where we asked both signers and speakers to generate pantomimes. We also um, designed these so that the verb that um, the ASL verb that would be associated with these pictures um, um, was not the verb that was generated, or was not a, a handling type verb, so that signers couldn't cheat and produce pantomimes. Um, so the verbs, um, the verb that goes with um, a broom would be to sweep, and that looks like this. Okay, so non-pantomimic. The pantomime would look like this. Okay, and here's the, um, for seeing a fork, the verb would be something like eat. But the pantomime would look something like this, pantomiming eating, OK? <laughs> all right. And finally, in all of these imaging tasks, you, you um, have a baseline task that gets rid of nuisance kinds of things, like just seeing an object um, and producing a motor response. So we had um, participants see lots of manipulable objects, like the trowel there. Um, and you would just gesture this if you could hold it in your hand, and you would do this if you couldn't for the few items that you couldn't. So we could sort of get rid of, first of all, sort of cognitive things, thinking about whether you can hold things, as well as sort of perception of these objects and, and the motor response. So we could really just hone in on regions that were involved in generating a verb or genera generating the pantomime itself. OK, so what did we find? We look at um, 
The regions that were active when deaf people produced pantomimes, it's what we expect. We see this nice activation in superior parietal cortex. It turned out to be bilateral, and it turned out to be pretty extensive, um, particularly when you compare it to what um, happened with the hearing participants. So the hearing participants had less activation, and it tended to be more left lateralized, basically replicating what other people had found before. We think what's going on here has to do with the nature of the pantomimes that were produced by deaf people compared to hearing people. Um, to be honest, deaf people were just better at it. Um, they produced more complex pantomimes. So for example, in producing, um, like if you saw a spoon and you were going to show stirring, a hearing person would do just something like this, loose, very loose hand shape. A deaf person would not only do that, but they would show the cup. Um, and um, often also would repeat, repeat the production. Their hand shapes were much crisper, just cleaner. So these um, deaf signers may have certainly more experience producing pantomimes and communication, um, but also just may have richer representations to draw on to produce these um, types of actions. But the key question was what happens when we look at verbs versus pantomimes? So now this is um, the, the image that when you look at um, deaf signers producing verbs, rather than pantomimes. And what we see is these are pantomime-like, patterning-like verbs. So what we see is these handling verbs that look like write and hammer that look very much like pantomimes, they're activating Broca's area. Okay? We don't see additional activation, well, I'll show you in a second, in SPL. And when we compare hearing people producing very similar type productions, um, we don't see activation in Broca's area. Okay? We see the same kind of thing, this SBL activation that we saw in the slide before for this other production. So it looks like what we're getting is language areas involved for the signers producing verbs, but not for hearing people producing pantomimes. And then the last thing to look at were these two types of verbs. So let's compare now within the signers these verbs that look like pantomimes and verbs that don't. Do we see any difference? Do we see more, for example, SPL activation for the uh, pantomime-like signs or not? And the answer is no. So this is sort of a palette from the, the um, PET study where if you would see more activation for handling verbs, it should be red, and more activation for these non pantomimic verbs should be purple. But you see a lot of green and light blue here. That means there was really no difference between these two verb types. They're engaging the same um, regions. Okay. So... Does the brain distinguish between pantomime um, and language even when they look the same? The answer is yes. So um, what you see is that for signs, um, you engage these language regions, in particular Broca's area, left inferior frontal cortex. We know this region is involved in lexical search and retrieval as well as phonological assembly. Uh, for pantomimes, what we see is bilateral superior parietal cortex, a very different region. We know these regions are involved in action planning and motor control. Now, I don't want to claim that sign production and pantomime um, production are just completely distinct processes in the brain. That's not the case. There's going to be overlap. You're going to see cases where you see activation in SPL for signing and some cases where you find activation in uh, Broca's area for pantomime production. But in general, what we see is when you're asked to do these different tasks, you, they draw on different neural resources. And the weighting of these neural resources is different for verbs versus pantomimes. So the brain is making a distinction between the two. Okay. So let me turn to the last question, which was looking at the nature of spatial language um, and whether we see an impact um, on the fact that sign languages are spatial languages where you move the hands in space on how we encode or how we talk about spatial information. So let me just start with um, this you know, really dramatic difference between how languages encode spatial information, where things are in space. So if we look at spoken languages, how spoken languages might um, encode a description of this scene, so the cup on the table, what do I have here, Italian. So English uses this preposition on, Italian uses a different preposition. Those of you who are bilingual in, in the room sort of think about how in your other language you might encode this information. Chances are you have a closed class, um, a grammatical element like a preposition, maybe a little a morpheme, um, an ending that you put on a word to indicate the spatial relationship. This is how most spoken languages encode this information. In contrast, in sign languages, 
um, to sign the kappas on the table would look something like this. Okay? So you have um, a hand shape that represents the figure object, a hand shape that represents the ground object, and it's where I place my hands in space that indicate the relationship. So I can say on, next to, under, maybe floating above, okay? Um, so there isn't um, a word that I can point to that means under or on or in. It's where I place my hands in space. And that's how these languages, um, and, 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 and to my knowledge, there are no sign languages that use something like prepositions or locative affixes to indicate um, spatial relationships. So this seems to be something that's very general across sign languages. Okay. Now, also, you'll see, um, I mentioned um, that you use what's called the classifier hand shape to indicate the type of object. Usually, um, you would sort of name the object, like hammer, table, and then indicate where they were located, OK? And this um, long, this is a hand shape for, or a classifier for long, thin, cylindrical, seated. There's a, there's a number of these different hand shapes. They're often iconic, and they indicate the type of object. They're called, although it's controversial within linguistics, but um, for the purposes of this talk, we'll just um, ignore that for now. Um, but it's, it's based on analogies to um, spoken languages that have these types of morphemes, these types of meaning units, where this is an example from Diageno, where you have this um, affix, this prefix a, that means, um, I have in here, long object. It alternates with another morpheme that means curved, and that's telling you what type of object was used to do the cutting. So it's, it's parallel in terms of these forms encoding information about the object. Um, and there's a closed set of them, just like there is for, for sign language. So this is why we talk about the, uh, the hand shapes. And um, the, the question is, given this sort of spatial system where you have um, these um, hand shapes that specify type and location specifies location, what, you know, what are the neural consequences of this? for spatial languages, okay? So what neural regions are involved in, under, or in, in producing these types of expressions, okay? That was the question. And what we wanted to do was sort of tease apart these different parts of the expression by looking um, at just the expression of location or just the expression of the object so that we could sort of neurally look at which regions were more associated with the production of the location or the object, okay? So the way we did that, again, this was a PET study, um, and while undergoing scanning, we asked participants to produce a classifier construction that expressed the location of an object. And the nature of the object didn't change, so it was always in, in one run, um, a, a clock in, in different locations with respect to the table. So the table, it was always, the same, and it was the location of the clock that changed. In each picture, you had to describe where the clock was. Okay, so that is just looking, focusing primarily on location. And we can contrast that with another case where now the location stays the same. You're always expressing something on top of a table, but the object itself changes. So it's either um, you know, um, a cylindrical object, so a bottle or a lamp. This is the classifier that's sort of general thing classifier or long thin. So now you're retrieving a, um, a, a hand shape for the classifier uh, or for the, uh, a hand shape classifier for the object. So our hypothesis was, based on behavioral data and other things that I haven't shared with you, that um, producing these hand shapes would engage language regions, that these are stored in the lexicon, you have to learn what these hand shapes are, and that they're going to engage language regions, that you have to retrieve um, and assemble that particular hand shape, okay? Whereas our hypothesis with location is that these particular locations in space are not categorical morphemes. These are actually um, non-linguistic locations, and you have to move your hand to a particular target location in space, and that these are not going to engage lexical retrieval regions because they're not stored in the lexicon. You don't store these locations. You have a different type of computation that you have to do. So that was our hypothesis going in in terms of looking at what brain regions would be engaged um, for these two types of expressions, locations versus objects. Okay? So we're going to contrast those two um, productions, and we want to look at regions that were more engaged for producing locations 
than for objects. And what we see is this bilateral parietal region, bilateral parietal, um, superior parietal cortex, okay? And this makes a lot of sense if you know what these particular, particularly these more posterior regions are doing, which is these regions are involved in spatial attention. And particularly, they're interested in what um, um, people who study sort of reaching behavior and other kinds of behavior talk about is visual motor transformations, meaning that what signers have to do to produce spatial descriptions, they see a scene, a cup on a table or a clock on a wall, they have to transform that visual information into a, a body-centered representation, and they have to reach towards a particular location in signing space, okay? And that targeted reaching and that targeted location is exactly what the superior parietal cortex is involved in non-linguistically in terms of, of reaching. So, um, and we don't see um, greater activation in um, language regions for the location task. One other thing to note is that this is different than what's been found for spoken languages. So what, people have done this um, type of task where you sort of name a spatial relationship. Um, where you have to um, produce a preposition or comprehend a preposition, you don't see this superior parietal activation. What you see is you see parietal activation. The parietal cortex is part of sort of the where system. It's an interface between um, knowledge about where and the linguistic system. But it's left lateralized lower. It's in the su super marginal gyrus. This is a region um, where people have suggested that this is where you sort of categorize location information in order to map a spatial preposition onto it, okay? So it's a very different type of computation than what the signers have to do, and you see a different brain region involved. So now let's look at, okay, now let's look at the reverse comparison. What regions are more engaged when you're producing these classifier hand shapes? Um, what you see, first of all, is this region that I mentioned before, this inferior temporal region. It's left lateralized. It's more active on the left. And this is a region that you see for spoken languages when you're doing a type of picture naming task. So it's, again, this kind of interface between object recognition and lexical retrieval. So I think what this says, yep. Um, but you also see, interestingly, this um, Broca's area, so the inferior frontal cortex being um, active for um, retrieving um, these classifier hand shapes. So what we're seeing is very similar regions that are engaged when you're actually just producing signs, um, you find when you're producing these hand-shaped um, morphemes that are expressing object type. So we suggest that this is evidence that these are categorical morphemes that are stored in the lexicon in contrast to these location kinds of information, and that you have to put those two together to produce these um, spatial expressions in sign language. So does the biology of linguistic expression impact the brain basis for spatial language? The answer is clearly yes. How does it do that? Well, what we see is that um, when, for sign languages, these spatial representations, what you have to do is rather than mapping it onto a single closed class word like in or on or next to, you do a transformation where you transform where objects are within a scene to a body-centered representation where the hands represent those objects and the locations and the, the relationship between the hands represents the relationship that you see in the scene. So it's a very different type of computation. Um, and that unlike um, classifier hand shapes where you get these language retrieval regions, locations aren't engaging these language regions. Okay, so you see this very different kind of melding of linguistic and non-linguistic information in the signed expressions. Okay. I um, just want to end with um, one other kind of caveat, because sometimes when I present this um, type of um, um, examples where cup on table or the clock on the wall, you think, well, it's so easy. You know, I mean, if, you know this has got to be the easiest system to learn in the world. Anybody who has taken a sign language course knows that these are the most difficult aspects of the language to learn, these classifier constructions. Um, and part of it is because, yes, you do map things kind of what, on, onto signing space, but there are tremendous amounts of linguistic constraints that you have to learn. You have to learn what the hand shapes are, and you have to learn idiosyncratic things about these, spatial, about these combinations. So, for example... Here's one example of expressing, um, you want to say that the boy is in the car, is sitting in the car, okay? 
Um, to do that, this is the um, uh, classifier for vehicles in ASL. This is for seated person. Okay? But if I do this, just this, it means the boy's sitting next to the car. It's a next to relationship. You have to, sh you have to use this arc movement to indicate that the boy is actually inside the car. Okay? So the movement is telling you the spatial relationship in this case. You can't just read it off where the signs are. That's just one example. There's constraints on which hand shapes you can use. So this, if you wanted to show someone standing on top of the roof of a car, this hand shape is one that's used for upright people. So you can have a person wandering the streets, for example. But you can't use that in this example. You have to use this sort of legs classifier, this other classifier that's used for walking. Okay? It's just something you've got to learn how to combine those. There's um, constraints on what's called um, markedness or what's most frequent and natural. So this is um, examples of showing uh, pens in a cup. Okay? So we have a cup. And then it turns out that for long, thin thing, there's actually a um, orientation where this is the top. Okay. Now, if I do sort of just a easily expressed um, kind of unmarked sort of canonical form, something like this. Okay. It can either mean the pens are all upright or the pens are all upside down. I haven't made a distinction between the two. Okay? But if I do this. It can only mean that the pens are upright. It can't mean the pens are upside down. This is the marked form. So you have to learn what these constraints are. You have to learn what the inherent sort of features are of these hand shapes. There's a whole other list of things that have to do with perspective and scale um, that have to be learned. So I just want to leave you with that, just so you don't come away thinking that um, these spatial expressions are really simple. We picked simple cases to ask simple questions, but the linguistics of them are much more complicated. All right, so what's my take home message? What I want you guys to leave with? Well, one is that even though signs often kind of look like what they mean, you have these iconic forms, it really doesn't alter the fundamental organization of human language or the neural systems that support language. So we see that in the case of, of um, the tip of the fingers experiences, where even though you have iconic signs, you still have this separation of meaning and form. In the neural domain, we didn't see a difference between pantomimic signs and non-pantomimic signs in the brain. They engage the same neural regions. Um, and that um, we do, however, in one domain, this very interesting domain of spatial language, how we talk about space, we do see an impact of the biology of language, um, both in linguistic structure, which I haven't talked too much about, but it, you can sort of get a feel for it in terms of this combination of sort of linguistic and non-linguistic information, as well as in the neural systems that are required to um, produce these types of constructions. Okay, so let me end. I first, um, I think it's really important to acknowledge the people who volunteer to be in our studies. The research is not possible without people volunteering um, to, to participate in our studies. So it's really important to thank the deaf and hearing participants who have um, worked with us in this research. Um, funding, of course. Um, and then my colleagues um, who um, were at the University of Iowa when we did this, um, Hanna Damasio, Tom Grabowski, and Sonia Mehta, who are now actually Hannah is at USC, and Tom and Sonia are at University of Washington. Um, and then Tamar Golan and uh, Robin Thompson worked on the TOF um, studies. And Steve McCullough is um, a deaf uh, cognitive neuroscientist in our lab. And they all helped on all of these studies. And I will end there by taking questions. So the, you know, that's a great question, actually. I mean, there's, and there's sort of two hidden questions in there. One, what's the internal representation like? I would like to know. It's hard to, because there's two, two things to think about. Is it an articulatory representation, or is it a sort of visual representation? And it's not easy to tease those two apart. 
my um, gut tells me that sort of this inner signing is art articulatory. And there's some anecdotal kind of cute things for, for why that might be. So for example, my deaf colleagues have told me if they're counting cards out, that you're, if you're sort of internally signing, you can get lost because your hands are moving as you hand out the cards, but you're trying to count with your hands as you have sort of an articulatory interference. And we have evidence from working memory studies that we've done that um, if you have to move your hands, um, you have worse memory. Hearing people, it doesn't bother them. They just recode into phonology or spoken language phonology, and so you don't have an effect. So there is evidence that um, you have an internal articulatory code, but there's also some interesting evidence, um, from, again, from our memory studies, where if you ask signers to remember lists of signs, but they have to watch a screen with non -shape, nonsense shapes moving, so you have visual interference, they have poor recall. Whereas hearing people, again, if you're doing it in speech, you recode into an auditory or vocal articulatory code, the visual stuff doesn't bother you. So that's suggesting that there's some type of visual representation. And there's also some really cool data from schizophrenia. So this is deaf people who have schizophrenia, who are signers. The question is, do they hear voices? What is, what is that phenomenological like? And this is important for really treating these patients and understanding what their experiences are. So there's a wonderful deaf woman, Jo Atkinson, who's done this work in Britain. And, the, the pheno and so you have to be able to interview these people in the right way. Often hearing psychiatrists don't have the right insights. So what her research has shown is that when you sort of hear voices as a deaf person, it's a complex experience. So part of it is actually something somatosensory. You sort of feel the hands. You also sort of can see some of the signing, or you can see um, mouths moving, this kind of thing. So it's a mix of somatosensory and visual information. So um, just theoretically, it would be really nice to figure out. And if you come to the talk on Friday, we'll talk a little bit about um, the sort of um, visual feedback and what's the, you know, are there visual, tar what's, the, what's the visual representation for sign? So I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. Thank you. Um, that's a speech or visual feedback? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, what's interesting is Susan Fisher, who's actually here, affiliated with NYU, did um, a nice study um, looking at whether if you, you know, if you speed speech up, you get um, a decrement. And there's a certain, I guess, uh, uh, rate or amount at which you can speed it up before it becomes unintelligible. And proportionally, it turns out to be the same for sign. So you, you speed sign up, um, and to the same rate, it becomes unintelligible with, as, as speech. So, so rate has a factor. And then, um, I don't know if this is speed, but so one who also um, has um, worked on sign language temporal processing at University of Maryland looked at, um, well, maybe I'll leave. That's too complicated. <laughs> Speed matters, yes. Uh, so if I want to move a hand to this position to speak and to understand the word, that's, can I, if I do this, does that matter? I see. So you're asking a little bit about the difference between transitional movement and, let's say, phonological movement. Can I rephrase your question that way? <laughs> there, there is a difference between those movement types. So in some ways, it doesn't matter so much for the transitional movement. So for example, let's take um, hand shape change. So you can have a change from one hand shape to another, like this. You can have a sign that has outward movement. Okay. Um, in that case, the hand shape change has to occur throughout that movement. So it's got to start and then change and then end with the end of the movement. That's a phonological transition. Now, let's say you have a sign um, that has an S, this hand shape, and another sign that has a five hand shape. I'm just making these up. Okay. Um, but the movement is not phonological. It's now just I'm getting from the location on my head to the location on my chest. Now, it doesn't matter. So I can open early and move, or I can move and open late. OK, so there's a difference. Um, this is work by Diane Brentari and Howard Poisner um, looking at um, how um, hand shape change is constrained. So in the transitional movement, you don't have those constraints. So in your example of can you just do this, it's OK. And some, this hand shape change shows that it doesn't matter. When it's a phonologically specified movement with hand shape change, then you have temporal constraints on how that hand shape unfolds over time. Question. 
And I was thinking about your point about spatial mapping. Again, my deaf colleagues in the yes, spatial mapping. And I don't know if you can compare this with hearing people because classifi uh, classifiers are so complicated, but deaf people are using hand shapes for spatial locations in everyday communication. And I'm wondering if there's developing a mental mapping of how spatial communication is used within the deaf community. And I'm wondering if there are any other studies that are parallel for that. Let me make sure I understand. So are you asking about whether hearing people might do the same thing, might have a spatial mapping if they have classifiers in their well, language? I, or I'm not, no, I, at a rate that is comparable to deaf people, say. Because if you give somebody a task that may not be a classifier, but say it could be a gesture of how one would arrive at a certain location of going over a hill, down the hill, then over to the left, and seeing uh, the, the gestures that a hearing person versus a deaf person would use. Have you studied things like that? I haven't looked at that exactly, but I've thought a little bit about it. Um, because um, you can think about whether let me back up. So what I said about location sort of being kind of non-linguistic in these spatial mapping cases. And then for the, for the gesturers, of course, it's kind of non-linguistic. And I think your question is, are these parallel? So for hearing people producing gestures in the same way, is it the same thing as what the, or similar to what the signers are doing when they have to, when they use gesture to indicate locations in space? Make sure that's, yeah. Um, we don't. Well, because yeah. uh, I'm specifically talking about gesture having to do with location. Because if you're stimulating that particular location in the brain, if deaf people are using it all the time, then is it a comparable task? Yeah, so I think that's a really great observation. Because um, I think for, for hearing people, it may be somewhat similar. But it's a little bit like the, the pantomime. Deaf people pantomime differently than hearing people do. Um, and I think that. Because deaf people do it all the time, and because it's obligatory, that's the only way you can describe these spatial relations, that in some ways um, it's, it's going to be different than what hearing people do when they gesture. They have the option of producing these gestures or not. Um, they may not um, be as targeted in the same way um, as as specific as a deaf person is in producing these locations. So you may get less, for example, activation in superior parietal than for the um, signers who really are targeting this particular location with respect to the figure in ground. So because it's become obligatory and part of the linguistic system, it may look different than what hearing people do when they gesture. But, but this is, we don't know. We, no one has done. It's, it's hard to get people to gesture in the scanner. People are starting to do it with, um, with, with either maybe Meg or with nurse, so you can be sitting upright and gesture and to see what happens. Um, but it's a great question. Thank you. So I've, I've been working with kids who have um, very impaired parents and siblings, and some of them even their native language would be American Sign Language, and then they started learning English. So what about their brain development or just out there on that? Um, there's, I don't know, I don't think anybody has looked at kids, although I, I, I'm not, I don't always know the child development literature. We've done a lot of stuff looking at adults who are um, bilingual, um, who acquired ASL from their deaf families and English from the surrounding um, communities. We have a large project looking at both um, the neural underpinnings of the two languages and um, just you know how, how they are as bilinguals compared to people who know two spoken languages. Um, what's interesting about this group is um, if you just take um, scans of these guys comprehending spoken language and comprehending ASL and you contrast them, you see huge differences, right? You see all this auditory cortex active for listening to speech and all of this parietal activation uh, for, for processing signs. And if you think if you took a Spanish speaker and a, you know, a Spanish-English bilingual and you compared listening to Spanish to listening to English and you did that contrast, you would see very little. I mean, the overlap between the two systems for spoken languages are, is, you know, it's essentially the same system as what, what people have found looking at bilinguals. It's not so for these bimodal bilinguals. Now, there are really core areas, the areas that I showed you, so, um, you know, inferior frontal, superior temple that are both active in both. So you see core areas active for both languages. But what's interesting about this group is because their languages draw on these different sensory and motor systems, 
you see differences. You see, and, and you also see differences in how, if you are a signer, there's certain cognitive skills that you have that non-signers don't. And so they're a really interesting group to look at from the viewpoint of, of bilingual studies as well as sort of the relationship between language and cognition. So there's been um, things out there. It's not that they look completely different. In fact, if they look, if we look at a monolingual English speaker comprehending English and our bimodal bilinguals comprehending English, we thought we might see a difference, absolutely no difference in terms of the brain areas that are engaged when comprehending English. So I hope that answers your question. I'm wondering how uh, necessary the classifiers are for the representation of a sign. And I'm curious because in tip of the tongue and experimental spoken language, often classifiers or gender, which are entries to now being accessed, are elicited when the word isn't. So I'm wondering if the classifiers and sign are elicited. Um, so let me say one thing about that. So those studies are probably looking at Chinese or Thai where you have numeral classifiers that are nominal classifiers. That's very different than the classifiers in, in, in sign languages. Um, these are not, um, they don't go with nouns. They're verbal classifiers. So in fact, that's why the example I gave you from Diageno, it's a, it's, um, a ver I mean, verbal classifiers in spoken languages are relatively rare where you have a verb that has one of these classifiers. So that's the first thing. So, um, when you look at these TOT studies, it's picture naming, right? Usually, I mean, it's object naming. And what happens is they can get the gender, they get the classifier, but they can't get the, the sign. So that same experiment wouldn't work for sign because it's, it, that's not the linguistic structure that they have. Oh, Philip? So in the example of classifiers that you had, um, there was a way to clean the Clearly distinguish between the what system and the where system. I'm wondering about cases in which you have um, uh, lexical elements which can be iconically modulated. So, so I'm thinking of, of, of an example such as the verb to grow, where depending on how you realize the verb to grow, it could mean grow a little bit, mm -hmm. grow a lot, it could mean grow, grow very quickly. It could mean grow very slowly. So do you have data on these kind of mixed cases? And what, what would you kind of ex expect in terms of uh, brain implementation? Would you expect like the dual behavior? Yeah. Or would you expect that as soon as they're used iconically, they actually fall into the non-linguistic system? No, it wouldn't be that neat. I wouldn't say that. Um, so there's a couple things to think about with that question. Um, Part of it is, if you think about the same question for, for spoken language, you can think of, I, so the way I sort of think about these things is a little bit, I, I think about it as what I call a gestural overlay. And you can have that in speech. So you can say, it took a long time, it took a long time. So you can have, the, I mean, it's not as eloquent as you, as you can get it in sign, but it's that element. And so you would wonder what happens also for spoken language when you have these sort of gestural elements superimposed. And we don't know the answer to that. Um, for sign, um, I don't think what you're going to see, so I wouldn't say that, okay, let's say you're using, um, you know, grow or, or, or the grow, you know, um, roots expand. Um, suddenly you get superior parietal activation. No, I think that activation has to do specifically with location expression, not iconicity per se. Um, I know behaviorally we have evidence that signers are sensitive to this gradient in a way that non-signers aren't. So this is an experiment where we look at these classifier hand shapes that I just have claimed are morphemes that are retrieved from the lexicon, they're stored in the lexicon. But we modified them with our, our signer. We had, so this was a signer describing a um, medallion um, hanging on a necklace, and it could be a really big medallion or a small or medium size. So we had a gradient of, of, of size in terms of the aperture of her hand, which is a little bit like your grow example, right? And so what we had um, signers, we had a signer have, there were like sort of um, maybe 10 of these small differences in gradient size um, examples. So each sign was a little bit bigger um, or smaller. We played these two, um, these descriptions of the, of the medallion to another group of signers, and they had to sort of select which of a range of sizes of, of, of medallions um, was being described. 
and you know, pick a sticker and put it on a necklace that we had on a piece of paper. So they had to, um, they would see in random order these different gradient sizes of this one hand shape. And the signers were very good at that. They could, they, they could tell you know, roughly what the gradient size was. Hearing people who were non-signers, we showed the same thing. You didn't get a correlation between um, the size of the handshape and the size of the sticker because they didn't have the linguistic knowledge that this is medium size and then I can have a gradient and this is small and this is really big. So they were kind of all over the place. So what I take from that is that signers know both the categorical information that this means medium size, this means small, and you know, this means really big, um, but they're sensitive to this gradient over this, this gestural part so that they know that, okay, well, I can, even though this basically means medium size, I can vary it um, in the same way that speakers can sometimes overlay this sort of intonation pattern or other kinds of things to give you this information. So I think that there is this combination, not just in these spatial classifiers, but in, in, in signs like, like this as well as with the, the hand shapes. What the neural basis for comprehending those variations is, I don't know. David? I'm interested in the sensory motor mapping problem. Uh, kind of a weird question, and I guess relating to interference. So we, we all have to make a, a form a relationship that sort of seamlessly allows sensory motor back and forth, for instance, when we're walking. You have visual information, and you translate that into some meta sensory and action information. That's how you move your limbs through the world. And so, since in the signer case, you need to engage that system all the time. Uh, so, I wonder I mean, this is a super naive experiment, yeah. but if you're having a conversation, two, two signers are having a conversation while walking. Mm -hmm. so, you get interference in the system because you're going to drive the same parietal systems that have to actually, that you need for navigation. Uh, they're going to be also taxed for communication. So if you have the same conversation walking or sitting, you get a different outcome. So there's two things I have to say about that. One is I would say that the analogy is not exactly the same. Part of the reason is when you're doing the visual stuff to map onto where you're walking, um, you, basically your idea is to avoid obstacles, right, and, and this kind of thing. So you're, it's, a visual, it's, it's, it's a visual motor integration kind of thing, right? So, so, I, so the point of, of, of knowing where things are is to avoid them. Or you can, I also think of it as reaching. That's not the way sign works, okay? Um, except to think of I need to contact locations on my body, right? But that's not visually guided. So nothing, so walking in some ways is visually guided, but signing is not visually guided. So there the analogy isn't quite the same. Um, the experiment about having a conversation just sitting versus walking is interesting only well, I mean, it's interesting, but I just definitely have this anecdotal thing about, and this may be just for deaf people who have good peripheral vision. I'm often walking and signing, and my deaf colleague is always saying, oh, <laughs> don't run into that, you know, because, you know, I'm completely oblivious because I'm focused on the signing and, and picking up what they're saying, and I will walk in the pool and other things. And deaf people don't have that problem. I mean, they'll sometimes, you know, tell their friend, don't trip over that, but, I mean, they have this much better, but I think it's more monitoring their environment better than a hearing person does. But I, I think the problems are different. I think that the walking example, again, um, is, is a, you're visually guiding your motor movements, and that's not what signs. Signs are not visually guided in general. So I think we have to thank Marianne.